Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Ugh, you got your brains all over that goddamn wall. Welcome to Double Feature. Michael, how are you doing this fine, fine evening? I'm doing, uh, I'm doing wonderfully. My name is Eric, and, uh, we're doing a show with two movies on We're gonna pair a couple films together. We're gonna do, uh... Red Rock West and Burn After Reading. So we'll call this the Because Red Rock West and Blood Simple Isn't Funny Enough right. episode of Double Feature. That's, yeah, because I've just recently watched Blood Simple. Yeah, that would have been perfect um, for this oh too, Oh my right? god. It I is, mean, that would have been actually a better double feature. Red Rock West and Blood Simple is an enthrallingly tense double feature. It is. Well, that's the problem. Too tense. Fuck tension. This way we'll get to uh, talk about a lot of Cohen stuff. But in a, in a light, happy mood that everyone will enjoy. Yeah. Uh, we're going to spoil both of the movies, obviously. You've heard this show before, right? No. no, I haven't. Seen. I haven't heard this show. And then you probably want to use the chapters feature to skip over the movies you haven't seen. Or you know what? You're a, a free operating human being. Maybe you want to spoil the movies for yourself. I yeah, can. I there can totally is always the possibility that people just listen to this show as an alternative to watching the films for, say, a date or trivia so they have a date with two strangers on the internet they don't know? Yeah, I guess that's pretty much... All right, so nothing wrong with that. No. What we're getting to is that we come on the show every week and we judge the listeners who do not watch the films. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. As long as you know what you're getting into. Uh, Red Rock West is the, uh, the first movie. Here's a name. Hasn't come up on the show in a while. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. John Dahl. Oh, yeah. So, John Dahl. Yeah, where do we know John Dahl from? We know John Dahl from, uh, from the uh, world-famous Joyride episode of world Double famous Feature. meaning one episode of our <laughs> podcast famous yeah you know what that's not even true it wasn't even the most famous episode on that show because that was also the jeremy caston episode oh my god so it was wasn't two thirds of the episode was <laughs> crazy talk and uh one third was joyride but we did joyride we love joyride and subsequently love john Dahl. it's jumping true his cars in front of trains although that was back when our show sounded like an insufferable review show yeah that's true so uh sorry everyone had to go through that but we did talk joyride and uh you were showing that to me yep. back in year one and i liked it quite a bit and obviously you know it was your movie you liked it too big fan of joyride we talked about him being a big neo-noir guy yeah and so i thought all right let's actually see that let's do one of those on the show you know rounders came out right before joyride and i think that's a, a fine example of that sure. stuff too but man, Red Rock West. And God it, damn. It showcases his stuff really well. I, so John Dahl, a little bit more background really quick. He also did, he did an episode of Breaking Bad, which you and I both love. Big fans. Um, but he basically is one of the showrunners on Dexter. He, along with uh, Ernest Dickerson and Steve Schill and Keith Gordon, I mean, between the four of those guys, they've basically directed everything every episode of dexter or almost every episode of dexter sure, for better for worse um over really just with the exception of the first season so right. the, the last couple seasons of that show this movie is a great showcase for him because he actually wrote this one that's a lot of complicated stuff i don't know if i could I get know. my head around writing i this know story. there's with this is uh well he had some help right so he wrote it with his brother rick okay. But yeah, on top of the, the usual directing stuff he has to deal with and doing a, a great job on that, he puts together this story that is, I mean, it's nuts in how, you know what I really want to talk about with this story is how crazy good it is yeah. and how it makes it look so simple. Yeah, it's so fucking cool. I mean, I use the phrase incestuous tension. To yeah, describe, that, no, I, I could describe that. Red Rock West. And, and what it is, is it's because the film starts... And you kind of get this vibe for almost a, a road exploitation with a little Western tinge, right? You know, when he doesn't get the construction job. Yeah, stylistically, it's the sort of, uh, it's like Arizona noir. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's hot, dry, dusty, truck and film time. It's almost like a, a night version of the movie Duel that yeah, we talked perfect. about. It's not terribly unlike Lost Highway's Road Darkness, sure. you know, parts of it too. I don't know. Maybe that's because Dennis Hopper's reminded me of our big. Uh, we got a David Lynch show finally coming up. Oh yeah, that that's we've true. Been, we've been gearing up to for a while, but the style is is 
thick and it's really interesting. Uh, it's just that that writing trumps everything sure. else in the movie. I mean, it folds back on itself and sure, every time sure. it's a situation and we talk about this a lot on the show mm-hmm. where it's bad and it gets worse. And just when you oh, think you mean the situation, yeah, yeah. where you think sometimes yeah, the writing sorry. does that in movies too. That's possible. Where the situation is bad and it gets worse, and you think it can't get worse, and it does. We talk about that on the show all the time. That's Love one of our that. favorite things. Yeah, is to kick people when they're down <laughs> sure. and just really drive home yep. the misery. Yep. But this is a really unique type of kick you when you're down misery mm-hmm. because it's constant olive branches of okay you're getting out of it sure. and it comes back to fucking wayne yeah it the olive branch whips you in the face to wayne yep, yeah that's it and you end up you end up back in red rock and you're just fucking tense again well it's a script full of great ideas mixed with underhanded characters that's yeah. exactly why that happens you know the the players in this story they create this situation for themselves and they're just uh they feed off of each other yeah. you know they have this I want to call it a parasitic relationship, but uh, everybody just drags each other down. I I don't know. It's, you know, we start with um, Michael Williams and he wanders into this bar, you know, after his construction thing or whatever, and he's mistaken for someone else. Sure. And this is, um, I mean, the movie does a lot of wonderful things, but man, this is one of the best. Well, this is the keystone to the whole film. Sure. This is So it kind of has to be. Yeah, this is the point where... Our character who deep down and based on a lot of the other things surrounding Michael, he's a good guy. Yeah. This is or at least the best guy, right? I mean, that's easy to say. Sure. But this is the point where the surroundings, the situation, where his life is, it gets the better of him. And he makes a glaringly wrong choice. Yeah. I mean, he gets into this bar and, you know, he's looking for work anyways or whatever. And this guy just gives him an opening. It's just right, there exactly. it is. He lays it on the... We've seen a couple times before, you know, when he walks by the money or whatever, where it's just saying, ah, take it. It's but he right doesn't, there. He doesn't do it. This you know, might be enough of a, oh, you have to work for it. See, he just wants work. Sure. It he seems, doesn't know what he's getting into. Right. Yet. And so it asks that question, you know, what if you just went with it? How long could you do that? What would happen if you just, somebody goes, oh, are you this person? And instead of responding honestly and saying, no. I'm sorry, you have me mistaken for somebody else. You just go, uh, I don't know, why not? Yeah, yeah, I'm this person. How long could you do that? It makes you really excited to hear what he uncovers just in that conversation. Yeah. I mean, it's all new to you as a as an audience in the same way that it is to him. He doesn't know what he's... I, he's literally every single syllable of every word is as fresh to him as it is to you. Right. So he doesn't know what he's he doesn't know what kind of movie he just sat down to watch and neither do you. And so you're I mean you're captivated by that. You know, that whole conversation you just fucking hang on it. It's giving you clues to what the film is about. It's what makes me really excited about detective stories when they're well done. So he goes from that scene and he goes and meets our femme fatale if we're going to follow sure. her in our blueprint. And, you know, you get that classic feeling right away. It's uh, it's not even what she does, but it's kind of what he does. It's as if he walks in and then throws her in the role of mm-hmm. femme fatale. He's going, you know what? I'm supposed to kill you, but we're going to hatch a plot. Basically deciding to make trouble at that point, sure. you know, to double down on the, the situation yeah. he's already, you know, gotten into. It's like you're talking about folding in on itself. It's just compounding the problem. But, you know, honest guy, what does he do in that situation? Right. He can't kill her right even though in retrospect that makes everything so much easier that's not the honest thing to do well the the thing about the story is that you constantly you end up in a situation like this and and this is the first time it really happens second time if you count the bar i guess you end up in a situation where he has the option of pull the plug there just stop where you are sure sure and just get out of dodge sure but instead he always makes a a decision that doesn't seem like the wrong decision. Sure. In this in this case, the decision to get him to safety the quickest way possible is to kill somebody. Yeah. But instead, he makes the I guess moral decision to maybe to not kill her. Yeah. That and then, in that in that particular instant, but that then is he the cashes moral in, and it just gets deeper and more twisted. Well, he thought he could get out of it by writing this letter. Sure. He thought, all right, I'll do the right thing and I'll bail and whatever. 
And, uh, I mean, we know she's trouble. She's way too into his character throughout the movie. She's not fooling anybody. But by the end, you know, that untrustworthiness is for a good reason. She's just surrounded by these depraved human beings. You know, and I like that instead of getting the uh, the kind of powerful femme fatale figure that, you know, I've evangelized so many times in the different pieces of noir we've done, she is, in fact, a coward. Mm-hmm. She is spineless and weak. She ends the movie begging and please, you know, what about half? I mean, there's nothing really strong about right. her. It's just manipulation. So with stuff like the letter, I mean, that's how the movie manages to not lose the enigma that it's built up. Because in that early conversation, I mean, we were just filling in holes. And uh, once the holes are all filled in and we know, you know, what's going on in this movie, what it's about, and everybody's aware that he's not who he said he was, uh, we could lose that enigma. But instead, we're just, uh, you know, we're delivering surprises. The way it kind of reveals those little things, it recreates the magic of that bar scene. Sure. Um, you know, like the little surprise sheriff mm-hmm. moment. The, uh, the moment that apparently Red State borrowed. I, uh, yeah. it was, it's so funny that that came up. Well, and the, the, so it turns out the sheriff is the bartender, is the guy paying off to ke- get his wife killed. Sure, the last guy he wants to see walk into that police station. Right. And initially you think, wow, that's shitty. And then you realize that he wrote that letter to the sheriff. Yeah, yeah. So and it's even worse. The letter that was originally going to be the saving grace and would eventually send the law swooping in is just going to the hands of the person who's already guilty. Oh, man, Michael, it's like fucking clockwork. He literally, he walks in and you go, oh, I really didn't want to see that guy. Oh, wait, that's the sheriff. Oh, wait, he wrote the letter to the sheriff. (laughs) It's almost like if you were making this movie up as you went along and you stopped in that scene, almost like you were doing improv or something, and you said, who is the worst person who could turn out to be the sheriff? Oh, I got it. And then there's another well-planned surprise in Dennis Hopper's character. Right. So I love, uh, you know, this has to be one of the best Dennis Hopper opening lines. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> it's better than fuck Mexico, actually. That's true. But God damn, do we love and miss and adore Dennis Hopper Absolutely. on this show. With every fiber of my he's, being. Uh, I, he's scary as fuck. He's great in this movie. He's scary on the roof. Um, or when, you know, when Nicolas Cage's character, sure. when Michael's on the roof and... He's even worse when he's in the, the house eyeing around. It's yeah. even but it's just that that classic Dennis Hopper blue velvet terrified going to find you feeling. Well, what I really like about Dennis Hopper's character juxtaposed against Wayne the sheriff mm-hmm. is when you find out that Wayne and Suzanne were criminals wanted by the FBI. Sure. You find out that Wayne's big crime was cooking books. Yeah. You realize he was an accountant and he was fraudulent. He turns out to be as weak as he's his wife. He's a white collar criminal. Yeah. And that's, that's why he's paying people to do right. his dirty well, but work. But that's when you realize that he's this white collar guy. He's not nearly as threatening as a guy who goes around getting paid to murder people. And that's when you see the, when the four of them are in the car, the power position is shifted. It's, uh, I mean, you slowly realize Dennis Hopper's character is, well, shouldn't be a surprise to us, but a fucking lunatic. Yeah. You know, he's, uh, it starts with that tension. He's looking around hitman kind of thing. And before you know it, he's springing out from doors, punching <laughs> you in the face. You know, you have that, the car scene, right? Sure. I mean, one of yeah. the most memorable scenes from the film that uh, kind of racing against the train and he's yelling and he's got that adrenaline junkie thing going. And then he's, you know, by the end, he's master villain and all the other characters are essentially competing to see if they can they can be worse human beings than him. Right. <laughs> all when originally, you have to remember, Dennis Hopper shows up and you think, oh, this might be our, our main character's war buddy. Sure. He might uh, turn this out could to be help. the saving grace. He even kind of defends him in the beginning when Wayne comes in. Sure. You know, but that's another great reveal. Uh, he goes in the bar with him. They're settling down, having a drink. And you go, oh, this might be some other guy who's going to, you know, fuck up his stuff. And then he asks about Wayne. And you go, oh, that's, that's him. That's the guy. And that's the great thing about the script again. I mean, every step feels like a reveal because they've been set up. These are now great payoffs. They never feel cheap because of that. Sure. You know, Williams knows he's pretending to be somebody. We know that. Uh, it isn't just, oh, turns out there's this other guy. By dropping that part in early and saying, you're taking the place of a guy who never showed up, 
you don't even go, well, well, hold on a second. Who is that guy? Why didn't he show up? Is he still right, around? You, just think, you don't even think about it. Yeah. You just go, oh, good, a job. And you're so, you know, enamored by, oh, what's happening in the scene? And what right. kind of job is this? And what are we going to go explore and do during the movie? And then later they come back and, oh, yeah, remember that guy? You probably didn't think too much about that. Oh, that's this guy. Yeah. Also great seeing the two different men who uh, found themselves in that hitman position and how drastically different they are. You know, Williams is probably, uh, we get this idea he's sort of reformed because of how ethical he is until he just gives up. Right. Until he just gets to the point where he says, well, I'm in a terrible situation. Time to just get the money and get out of here. And every once in a while, you sort of see him turn back to that. He's pouring the money out of the train and stuff. Just kind of going, wait, I really, I'm, come on, I'm the good guy. I should really just sure. throw this money out. Well, I think by the end of it, he just wants to get out and be okay. Yeah, although but it seems okay so much... okay is, is padded with have enough money to sure, be okay. Sure, right. It just seems more natural to him to fall back on that. Sure. It, uh, without the movie ever really saying so, it feels like the guy who's getting out of the game, who used to be, you know, shady. Sure. And is now trying to turn his life around right. a little bit. But when the fucking going gets tough, it's just, he just falls back into, I'm shady. That's just right. what he knows. Is one of the things that allows us to get all the way to the end of the movie, really, without any twists or turns. Uh, we get a lot of these surprises, but it's not a, a what a twist kind of. Right. You sure. know, the, the choices are made based on the moment and based on who these characters are. And that's why they find themselves in the constant predicaments they do, why they're turning on each other. Not because it was the plan all along to turn on each other, but because of the, the situations. No one character really trusts the other characters. I mean, none of them in any direction. Rather than backstabbing them or using them, though, uh, they're just quick to turn on each other because they don't know each other. You know, Lyle wasn't sworn to Wayne in the beginning. He right. was kind of defending Michael. And then he's working for Wayne, but only until he finds out that Wayne's plans all went to hell and that, you know, he could be in charge now. It's the same thing between... You know, Wayne and Suzanne, who obviously were married, but that's fallen out, and right. now they're backstabbing each other. Uh, but that happened well before the movie even started. Or Suzanne and Michael, just the whole yeah. thing. Without any kind of strong allegiance to one another, they're just throwing themselves into risking everything by relying on one another to try and get this giant score. Right. The other thing that's pretty surprising is this ending we do get to is essentially from uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space. Yeah, it's really kind of goofy. We're in a foggy graveyard, and yeah. I don't even question it until we start getting wide shots of a foggy graveyard. Right. And I've seen it enough times to kind of go, wait, hold on, why are we in a foggy graveyard? <laughs> How did we find ourselves here? But even in that scene, you know, it distracts you because everything is so delicate. Sure. This is, I mean, we know this is the end game, and it's a fucking game of chess. Every single little move, every exchange, in order to get out of here, everybody has to make about, you know, three to five moves and they have to ask other people for help. Right. It's building upon the the best things from the rest of the movie in terms of these character interactions. You know, they have to trust everybody momentarily because they're forced to. Well, because you can't have your back against three walls. Exactly. Exactly right. So it's always which is the person who is least likely to betray me right. in this moment exactly. right now. And so they're playing that elaborate four-way game. And, you know, someone has to open the safe. So who's it going to be? Well, I'll send Dwayne over there. You know, Dwayne knows where the safe is and whatever. That makes sense. Oh, but Dwayne finds a gun in the safe. So now Dwayne, he's got the upper hand, but he needs the keys. So, you know, he has yeah. to go back. And then uh, Hopper's character needs to keep an eye on all three of them. The caretaker shows up and just complicates this, <laughs> this already muddied situation. And uh, everyone just continues screwing each other over because that's the conflict we've uh, we've gotten ourselves into. Yeah. So look at that, an entire section talking about John Dahl without me going on and on about film noir lighting. Wow, look Who at you. Who would have thought? It's just because the script is so good. It's, it's true. It's the thing that shines here, outside of obviously the performances. I mean, when you have the right. nuttiness of Nicolas Cage and Dennis Hopper, in the same film together. Yeah, it just. It I think that's one of works. the reasons I remember that car scene. Yeah. Because it's just so much crazy in one tiny vehicle. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things that make, uh, you know, Wayne and Suzanne's character 
I don't want to say pale by comparison, but they seem like normal people. Sure, almost. but at the beginning of the movie, they were the nuts. They were the nuts. They were the yeah. scary ones. Yes. But nobody is nearly as crazy as John Malkovich in real life <laughs> or in Burn After Reading. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of One Sheets. I've yeah. talked about this a little bit sure. on, on the show before. One Sheets being the, uh, the 27 by 40-ish posters. Um, they're usually the, the first official art that comes out regarding a movie. Now on the internet, we get stills a lot sure. from production. Which is lame. Yeah. Uh, one Sheets, so much cooler. But even better than stills, a One Sheet shows you the kind of artistic direction yeah. of a film. Right. You sort of get a feel for what kind of film is this going to be? Who's in it? What is it about? What is the style? It's the first time you see in a single frame, in a single picture, what is this movie? Am I interested in yeah, this? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a lot of one sheets around here. Mm -hmm. I've always had, you know, one sheets framed in my apartment. I just really, really love them. There's uh, an interesting one for Burn After Reading. We've never talked about this guy. I think his name's pronounced Saul Bass. Okay. He, um, he didn't actually do the one sheet for Burn After Reading. But he's, uh, he's done a lot of really influential stuff for, especially that Hitchcock kind of era. You know, he did uh, Magnificent Seven and Vertigo okay. and Anatomy of a Murder. I think his, one of his most popular ones, at any rate, was The Man with the Golden Arm. That's the one I've seen kind of spoofed and, uh, and paid tribute to in a lot of different ways. Also did one for The Shining that cool. I uh, ended up not using for our cover art. But you should look that up. It's the, the yellow one on there. So these are all great minimalistic types of covers. They're uh, using you know textured panels and cut out letters. His typography is really easy to recognize. If you look at the well, what will probably be the cover art for this show, or uh, just look up his name S A U L B A S S, you'll totally notice a lot of his work. But he also inspired a lot of more modern design because of that kind of trend in minimalism mm -hmm. lately. Uh, that textured background, really simple ideas, just let the icons speak for themselves sort of thing. Sure. I wanted to bring up this guy really quick because unless we pull out some really specific Billy Wilder or Hitchcock movies, I don't know if uh, I'll even remember or get a chance to talk about him. But aside from all of the influential poster art he did, and I should be clear, when I say one sheets in uh, relation to Saul Bass, that's all you know artwork. None of it's... Um, I'm looking at the spiral one right behind you that's kind of actually a still from the movie. It yeah. also has kind of a textured background, cool, minimalistic thing going. But this is all stuff that he designed and painted or drew or what have you. He also did the logos for, uh, I mean, Bell Telephone and AT&T, Quaker Oats. Okay. You know, these huge, the fucking Kleenex logo, a bunch of airlines. You know, so when you see that that AT and T logo or the Bell one, I remember because you know what that looks like, even though Bell doesn't really exist at right. least in the United States. I don't know if they're anywhere else. These very very memorable logos. One of these unsung guys whose work is everywhere. There's an actual movie to be had on the show. Oh, Sorry. that's true. Yeah, tangent time. Uh, and this apparently, is a, it's about spies. Yeah, this is a spy thriller. Go fucking right? figure. I didn't know shit about this movie. The thing about the Coen brothers for me mm -hmm. is that their titles are all bad. They're distracting. For me. They're, I'm yeah. going to just. No, I'm not even going to say distracting. I'm going to say they have shitty titles. Okay, that's fine. Um, well, they did have The Hudsucker Proxy, <laughs> yeah. which may be the worst title of all time. And I, but it's I, okay because we gave it uh, the worst episode of all time. That's true. But what was with The Hudsucker Proxy? It was for kids. Um, no, I mean the, oh, that was the social network. Oh, whatever. That part was fine. It was the Hudsucker proxy part. That was terrible. Um, but the thing about the Coen brothers is I haven't seen the majority of their filmography. And I keep saying that every time I think I see, it's not true. anymore. it's getting to the point I think where I can't see the majority anymore. on double feature. I love some of their movies. You love some of their movies. But, That's, I remember your reaction to the big Lebowski. Yeah, that was great. perfect example. But the thing is, is I, the movies I haven't seen, I know the titles. Yeah. I knew that Burn After Reading was a Coen Brothers comedy. In my head, it had something to do with a bunch of people at maybe like a literature party, like a, <laughs> sure. like a book club. Wow, you are yeah, uh, watching way too much exploitation. No fucking idea what was going on with this movie. And it starts with the aerial view and the zoom and all the spy type. Yeah. And immediately I'm lost and it's too chic and I'm just You're, completely yeah, you surprised don't know where with you, what's happening. Yeah, you don't know what you got yourself into. I never do. They wrote this spy thriller and I love this. They wrote it because, uh, I don't know, we've never done a spy thriller before. <laughs> Why not do a spy thriller? 
and they basically wrote all the parts with the actors already in mind. Yeah, that that goes without saying. I mean, it is the best kind of process for filmmakers to have. And it's nice that they're in a cushy spot where they can just do whatever Snap the fuck they want. Snap their fingers and there's John Malkovich and... Well, yeah. and more so that a studio is just, okay, whatever, spy thriller. Yeah, that's thriller. true. Yeah, that's good. Coen Brothers spy thriller, yeah. Just because they thought this would be fun. They're going to write parts for all these people they know. They're going to put them in there. I assume they got basically everybody. I can't imagine any... Especially with a weird cast like this. Yeah. Who did you not get? And uh, and so you come up with this thing that is... Uh, I mean, it's a, a web of a fucking... CIA thriller spun by online dating intrigue. Yeah. You know what I mean? What an absurd way to start your movie. Well, it's great as a spy thriller because the people who are actually involved with the CIA are not spies. Yeah. Uh, they're yeah, it's, what, you're analysts right, it's a, and treasurers. And sure. then there are people who think they know what spies do who sure. are acting all spy and the other people just want them to get out of their lives. Yeah, it's a lot of people who are working at low levels of the government that want to think they're super, super huge sure. rock stars. And then the people who are actually conducting the majority of the spy thriller work at a fucking gym. Yeah, they have one of the one of I mean, it's not necessarily a thankless job, but it doesn't carry the prestige of CIA. It's in the game. And so this gets even crazier for me because uh, thinking about this process, you're writing the spy thriller, you write these parts for all these people. I'm trying to imagine, I mean, okay, so I come to you, I've written this thing up, right? Right. I want you to be an actor in this, and you're you're Brad fucking Pitt or whoever, okay? Brad Pitt is a great example for who you're discussing in in this film, I think. I write this thing, and I come to you, and I say, Michael, I have written this role just for you. It would be perfect for you specifically. You play, well, you play a baboon. You are stupid. You are the stupidest person alive. In fact, you're dumb as a fucking rock. I know you would just be absolutely great for it, Michael. Like, how do you feel about it? You know what I mean? It's weird. You do this to basically every actor in the movie. You're a great actor. I've written this thing. I think finally, this is your moment. You're going to shine. Yeah. You play the dumbest man alive and you're competing with all these other dumb people. But the thing is, is they all just fit that role so well. They do a a lot of them. I probably can. I probably would have on paper, not knowing picked John Malkovich. Sure. I wouldn't have picked Francis McDormand. I wouldn't have even considered Brad Pitt. Yeah, I know. Right. And George Clooney is always a surprise. Well, this is also Brad Pitt before Inglorious Bastards. Right. When he, I mean, I wouldn't call him dumb in that movie, but he kind of, he has some charm. It seems like this role might have helped him build up sure. to. Well, Brad Pitt, I think his biggest strength is coming in as a, as a, not the star. He comes in as a character actor, a supporting character. Yeah, right. Where he can be big in small parts. Sure, sure. And that's where he really excels in this film. I mean, this is the absolute poster image for Brad Pitt being a big character in a small role. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, and if you've ever come across uh, interviews or whatever back from when Burn After Reading came out, everybody asked the people who are in this movie about this. You know, were you offended playing a stupid sure. person, <laughs> fucking buffoon? And the actors, I mean, pretty much all of them were a little puzzled with kind of a hint of offended <laughs> thrown yeah. in there. It's hard to say which one. I mean, you know, Linda's intense. Linda's a, a one that I was really surprised by, yeah. uh, too, because you don't... With, with Francis, you think... Uh, maybe you think Fargo. You definitely don't think something like this. No, this with type Francis of, McDormand, I always think strong female, you know, sure. independent woman. And she does carry that in this, but it's with this weird... Body image. Insecure edge. Yeah, well, it's and, the insecurity that makes it different yeah. than... Something like Fargo, I mean, people will talk about the characters being simpletons and that... But I thought that was uh, charming by comparison right. to this. This is yeah. more it's more embarrassing, kind of. Well, this is that was dumb people in a slow environment. This is dumb <laughs> people in a fast environment. You know, when you get introduced to her, it's the perfect way to do this, too, right? Because she's talking to a surgeon. So by nature, it's someone who's trying really hard not to respond to the crazy things she's saying. Right. Her body criticism or, you know, she throws something out and he has to just be... It's beyond objective. He has to just be neutral about yeah. everything. And so, you know, it's really the most abrasive exposure you could get to her personality. It's as if you didn't know someone at all and they started saying these things. And right. you were just trying to be as politically correct uh, <laughs> in a manner of speaking as you could be. 
But she's not the one I think of all the time. It's it's George Clooney's character, who we see at the party uh, doing what I can only assume is a Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice yeah. kind of uh, impression. But he has, you know, the same monologues every time he talks to somebody. Uh, he gives these to everybody he meets to the point that when uh, when that moment of violence comes later, I think, oh, well, now you got an anecdote to yeah. share with people because that's what he needs. God, and that violence. It, so let me tell you something, if I sure. may, about one thing I did know about Burn After Reading mm-hmm. was spoiled that Brad Pitt dies in a closet. Oh, interesting. And when he was in this closet, <laughs> sure. I was sitting there going, this isn't the closet. This could not be. There's no way this is. Oh, my God. There's a hole in his head. Yeah, I know. It's great. It's uh, it's so funny. We did super. It's this is, I mean, the complete opposite of sure. everything. If you hadn't seen super, you didn't listen to that show. Fuck you. You should see super. Um, It's, I mean, most importantly known for. It's treatment of violence yeah, and how it will take, uh, take violence that is really, really terrible, but it's in a superhero movie. You should feel good about it, and tonally it treats it like it's fun superhero violence, but it makes you feel devastated yeah. and awful. And in Burn After Reading, we have, I mean, an immediate and shocking moment of what is really uh, violence, grotesque violence, like, sure. like any realistic violence, but it's funny. And the movie plays it completely straight. It does the opposite tactic of Super. Right. It's saying this is, uh, this is very, very serious violence. And it shows you very, very serious violence. Somehow humorous. Don't know how it happens. Somehow humorous. The tone of the movie everywhere does weird stuff. I mean, it, it's a film that suggests it's a blockbuster spy thriller. But, you know, even bigger than that. The score, especially. Sure. The score says, I am bigger than a blockbuster <laughs> spy. And... From the very beginning, you know, you have these huge, insane drums that are just, you know, you couldn't get away with this in the highest moments of a spy thriller. And you're doing it in in what is, uh, by comparison of the, the climaxes here, a mundane scene. It's um, this larger than Hans Zimmer kind of thing. And it, it's giant and screams, hey, this is important. Yeah. Which is great for the movie because everybody treats this trivial thing as if it's the most important thing that's ever happened in the town or maybe even in their lives, you know, finding these CIA documents. Uh, the score is done by Carter Burwell, who I don't know how we've never talked about, but he's done uh, every last Coen Brothers movie. Huh. You know, he's he even did small pieces of music for O oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Oh, yeah. Which I remember us talking about, you know, largely being a, a T-Bone uh, produced thing and having all of this, you know, being kind of musical mm-hmm. itself. So Burwell shows up on everything, but uh, in the same way, Roger Deakins was the cinematographer for the Coen brothers for really a long time. I mean, probably not as long as Burwell. He, he didn't start with blood simple, but, yeah. uh, he worked with them, I think all the way up until this movie, this was the first one he didn't do. So I mentioned the cinematographer here, even though it's, it's not a movie where I might go on and on about the cinematography. Because the cinematographer they replaced him with is uh, Emmanuel Lubinsky, who we went on about in Children of Men oh, yeah. quite a bit yeah. as crediting a cinematographer when that's not something we usually do. And, you know, his work in Children of Men is still, even now, even, uh, what, a year after we did that mm-hmm. show or four years, I don't remember when that was. I don't was. know how many shows we have. Uh, Children of Men, just uh, just want to check back in with you. Cinematography is still about the best you can still think of offhand. pretty much the best there is. So I love that he showed back up here. And then another name who has come up on the show only briefly, and somebody I'm going to use this uh, movie as an excuse to talk about, which is Tilda Swinton. Oh yeah, from that creepy GIF online. I love that you pronounce GIF correctly, but I haven't seen that. Uh, she was, you know, in Orlando, the Virginia Wolf movie. Uh-huh. That was kind of where she got her big start, but the, the deep end and adaptation and Michael Clayton with George Clooney. And then I think there was one other, uh, Benjamin Button with oh, yeah. Brad Pitt, probably been in a lot of crossover stuff with sure. a bunch of these different actors. But we talked about her just briefly in Constantine yeah. playing kind of a, a weird role back then. She's done a lot of art house stuff. And the thing that I find really interesting about Tilda Swinton, I mean, she gets a lot of praise as an actress. Mm -hmm. She's won dozens, if not fucking hundreds of awards or been nominated or whatever the fuck any of that means. 
But she famously said she would rather be handsome than pretty. Yeah. Looking at her, she's a very androgynous woman. And despite having been nominated for all these awards and clearly being able to act, you know, getting into the, the mainstream almost by necessity because of how highly in demand she is, she's still a model. She does, uh, she does this kind of photography modeling. It's not the, the Mia Jovovich or however. I've already for, forgotten how to pronounce her That's name okay. from when she did it for us. Damn it. <laughs> she doesn't do Mia's stuff where, oh, I started in modeling and I had the fifth element and I transitioned into this stuff. Maybe she did. I don't know enough about her background. She's clearly got an acting background, but consistently does modeling for art photography because she has to. Yeah. Because she looks the way she does. Right. She has this kind of, it's I, it, it, her body, her face, her it's, hair. It's extraterrestrial in a really... Everything about her it, begs to be photographed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's this really attractive, ethereal, departed look. It's the androgyny. I mean, I can't think of... I used to, before I knew Tilda Swinton... I thought about Brian Molko from Placebo being, yeah. you know, poster child of androgyny or whatever. But like, fucking Tilda Swinton, just do yourself a favor. Google image search Tilda Swinton. <laughs> if you really want to get intense, Google image search Tilda Swinton androgyny. You will find all sorts of just amazing, amazing images of this person. So Burn After Reading, again, I, it's, a, it's a spy movie. Yes. I, I'm still a little surprised. That <laughs> I know, it's a you're spy still movie. way back the at only, step one. In fact, the only thing about this movie that seems like a spy movie is when they're back in the CIA doing the briefing. Yeah. And that's how I feel about the movie. They're doing the, uh, well, this is what's going on. And then uh, sure. J.K. Simmons, uh, BR from Thank You for Smoking. Yeah, right. He's sitting there doing the, so how does this apply so to us in is, the, yeah is there a, <laughs> right is there anything going on no oh all right then keep me posted if anything becomes understandable yeah he shows up towards the end and this uh i mean to think back about how we've been talking about this movie it's surrounded by the cast every uh everything we have to say about this movie is cast and crew who worked on it because ultimately, the movie is about those characters and sure. that cast. Well, it's a Coen Brothers movie. And, yeah. It's always about the characters. Sure. Yeah, but I mean, it's the, you know, you can't even really give the Hudsucker Proxy, I could tell you what that plot was about. That's true. Uh, oh, Brother, Where Art Thou, I could tell you what that plot was about. Burn After Reading, I mean, I guess I could still give you a synopsis but of it. But it's less important. You couldn't do it without mentioning the characters. Right, that's true. Who the characters are is part of the high concept. I mean, this is... Important documents found by idiots. And so if you don't have your idiots, you don't have your movie. That is what your premise is here. So at every beat of the story, it becomes incredibly important who those characters are. Otherwise, you have no farce. There is no farce here. J.K. Simmons is the, the nail in the coffin. Yeah. He's, um, you mentioned the great thank you for smoking thing. Uh, I think about him probably most recently He's got that part in Spider-Man that's iconic, yeah, even though it's newer. Very true. Um, I guess no longer newer, but the newest thing for me that is J.K. Simmons is Cave Johnson. Oh my God, Cave Johnson. But I don't, when you start thinking about Portal and Cave Johnson, and uh, he got a lot of recognition for that, which is great. I also think Steve Merchant does incredible that's voice work so in true. that. Just absolutely phenomenal voice work in that thing. Steven Merchant's part in that stands out to me as uh, second really to only maybe Mike Patton, which I really like the stuff he's been doing, and Michelle Forbes, particularly her part in Dark Athena. Uh, and I guess I have to mention Half-Life for her too. Portal just had so many, I mean, it doesn't get recognition by a film audience nearly enough. Uh, the second Portal, the yeah. sequel to Portal, just for the, the only a couple characters and their voice work is great and their story is great. And Simmons is just as awesome as Cave Johnson and yeah. just as well recognized. I think it's one of those things that helps that medium transcend into the art world a sure. little bit more. Well, one of the best things anybody on our listenership can do right now is Google Cave Johnson sayings. Yeah, well, uh, that too. There's a lot of great the stuff one, written What's the one that's on all the shirts? Uh, when Life Gives You Lemons. YouTube that because there's also these great little shorts on you know why you should invest in technology that uh that valve made for that thing and it was uh, just incredible to say that his work on there helped bring that medium as a whole 
into film world and into art world is the the tribute that his performance needs. So he's the one who, aside from representing, you know, what are we doing in the spy movie? He also is the one who sees that, oh, this is clearance level three. It's almost this, uh, you can see this kind of relief to him as if to say uh, this whole thing that's before us, this entire fucking movie is no big deal. What is a big deal is we have uh, we have this website. It's doublefeatureshow.com. Huge deal. We also have an email. That's doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. More importantly than even those two things. Oh, I know. I know what usually I've been here before. This is uh, the ending of the show. So let's see. Email, Facebook, the thing, all the crap we usually say that people have tuned out by now. Movies. The yeah. movies next time that's, on yeah, Double Feature. One. Right. So next time uh, we're, we're back to our journey. Wait. Not that journey. This is a journey that we threw out the window last year yeah, um, right. and then got tons of Haiti emails for throwing it out the window. This is our uh, spaghetti western Sergio Leone kaiju journey. Yeah, that was kind of weird. Um, we, didn't, we didn't even know. I mean, that's eventually what inspired other journeys on yeah. the show. But yeah, that's something that I feel more like it was a dangling plot thread yeah. that uh, a couple of viewers, it's the Libby of our show is yeah. basically what it is. Yeah. People have tuned in and they said, hey, I was really interested in that that one idea. You guys, ha- are you not going back to that or what I happened? I cannot there? count how many kaiju emails I've gotten. So before we did uh, Sergio Leone's first dollars movie, A Fistful of Dollars, right? Uh, the, the big Clint Eastwood uh, as epic as a spaghetti western could ever... No, I will say more epic than a spaghetti western ever thought it could be. But we did it with Gojira. Right. Which was, uh, for American audiences, that is the monster Godzilla. Yeah, it's basically the first kaiju movie of all time. And that was a... Man, that was a full show. And sure. we said, you know what? There's a lot more kaiju and uh, we want to do these other Leone movies. What do we do about that? Well, I think what we do about that is we do for a few dollars more... And Gamera, Guardian of the Universe. Okay, so for a few dollars more, everybody will be able to find. Sure. Uh, this Gamera movie is the one from 1995. Right, it's the second era of kaiju. It's be- it's the first in that second trilogy that they made about Gamera. Gamera's a... Ter- watch more fucking film. And bye. <laughs>